Welcome to a Legendarium special about Jean Baptista van Helmont, the alchemist who challenged alchemy. In this episode, we will talk about a Belgian born scientist who challenged the very foundations of Orthodox scientific thought. Jean Baptista van Helmont was born on January 12, 1580, in Brussels, located in modern day Belgium, to a wealthy family of the landed gentry. He studied at Louvain, where he finished the coursework in philosophy and the classics, then flirted with theology geography, and the law. Dissatisfied with all these studies, he finally found a discipline which he believed would allow him to serve all humankind. Thus, he earned a doctorate in medicine in 1599. For a time, the university made him a lecturer on surgery. However, Helmont later developed a bad case of scabies and found the usual treatment with enemas and inducing vomiting to be ineffective and even crippling. Disillusioned by the failure of orthodox medicine, he later called his education reaping straw and senseless prattle. Van Helmont gave away or threw away his books, then embarked on the Grand Tour of Europe, typical for a young gentleman to finish his education. First, he traveled to Switzerland and Italy, and then to France and England. Every step of the way, he learned more and more medical skills that he used during an outbreak of the plague in Antwerp during the year 1605. During this grand tour, he also came to know and appreciate some of the theories of the German Swiss physician Paracelsus. Van Helmont received several offers from princes, an archbishop, and an emperor to become their private physician. Yet Van Helmont turned them down, refusing to live well while his fellow men lived in misery. In 1609, Van Helmont married into an aristocratic family, thereby becoming the manorial lord of several estates. He retired to one of them called Merode in Vilvarud with his wife Margaret Van Ranst. For the next seven years, he dedicated himself to chemical research and to the relief of the poor. To the latter end, he ran a booming medical practice which drew many for he refused to accept any fees for his services. Being rich, he could afford to do so. He had several daughters and three sons, but lost two of the latter to his old enemy, the plague. Van Helmont published very little until near the end of his life. This may be explained in part by the fact that his first known book of the magnetic curing of wounds, published in 1621, led to trouble with the Spanish Inquisition. At the time, his homeland, the Southern Low Countries, remained under Spanish. Spanish rule. In addition to suggesting that saintly relics might show their healing powers through magnetic powers, he also included some harsh comments about the Jesuits which did not go over well with the church. As a result, church court proceedings remained pending against Van Helmont for more than 20 years. Small wonder that Van Helmont said nothing that would further the court's interest in him. As a man of his age, Van Helmont accepted some of the basic ideas of alchemy. These included spontaneous generation of some animals. For example, it was believed that mice would suddenly spring out of sweaty shirts. He also accepted the transmutation of metals and the existence of a medical cure-all waiting to be discovered. While Van Helmont never claimed to have unlocked the secrets of making a philosopher's stone, he did claim to have seen one in action. Van Helmont described it as being the same color as saffron in powder and said that he once used it to turn eight ounces of quicksilver into gold. Of course, many men of the time made similar claims, and if any of them had been true, we'd be up to our armpits in gold. 
However, Van Helmont insisted that knowledge of the natural world could only be obtained by experimentation and observation, not by reading 1,500 or 2,000-year-old texts. Van Helmont lived during the 17th century when modern scientific method based on observation and experiment came into being. For Van Helmont, knowledge came as a divine gift from God, and man must use all the means God gave him, including the study of the scriptures, prayer, meditation, mystical illumination, and of course, observation of nature. That led Van Helmont to reject conventional wisdom. Many of his writings, done in secret to avoid the attention of the Inquisition, dealt with the refutation of commonly held views. For example, he rejected Aristotle's four elements, namely earth, air, fire, and water, a sacred cow of his time. Surprisingly, he also rejected the three principles of Paracelsus, namely salt, mercury, and sulfur. For him, air and water could be the only true elements, and he proved these could not be interchanged, as some thought at the time. In what is perhaps his best known experiment, Van Helmont placed a five pound willow in an earthen pot containing 200 pounds of dried soil. Over a five year period, he added nothing to the pot but rainwater or distilled water. After five years, he found that the tree weighed 169 pounds while the soil only lost two ounces. He concluded that 164 pounds pounds of wood, barks, and roots arose out of water only. While he did not include the weight of the leaves that fell off every autumn, and obviously he knew nothing of photosynthesis in which carbon from the air and minerals from the soil are used to generate new plant tissue, by finding the soil unchanged while the tree grew larger, Van Helmont proved that plants grew through the absorption of water rather than spontaneously generating from the dirt. In another experiment, Van Helmont demonstrated that, contrary to the beliefs of his contemporaries, dissolving a metal did not destroy it. Van Helmont weighed silver, dissolved it in acid, and then recovered the original silver by reacting the solution with copper. And further experiments showed that acid served as a digestive agent in the human stomach and could be neutralized by alkali. Sometime before his death in 1644, Van Helmont gave his surviving son, Francis Mercurius, the responsibility for publishing all his writings. The result was a seminal medical work of the 17th century, the 1648 book Ortus Medicinae, or The Origin of Medicine. That wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.